Thank you very much. And uh, thanks for everyone for coming out this evening as well. Uh, very interesting topic area. So as introduced, I'm a urologist. I work in Mid Island. Um, that's uh, what I've been doing for eons. And about um, seven or eight years ago, I had a patient uh, approach me uh, who had had uh, basically chronic pelvic pain. Um, in the old days, we used to call it prostodynia, uh, or prostatic pain. He had had uh, various different uh, procedures done, uh, prostate resections, he had injections, he had tried narcotics, he had tried all kinds of other pain medications, and nothing had worked for him. I think he had probably gone through all the urologists on the mainland and on the island. Um, and he approached me to see if there's anything I could do, and you know, I went through the whole gamut, sort of reviewing his chart, and really it turned out that you know everyone had thought of everything. Uh, so he says, so he asked me, he says, well, what about cannabis? And I said, what about cannabis? I don't know anything about it. Um, and uh, anyway, long story short, I did a bit of research. I said, leave it with me. Let me do a little bit of homework behind it. And as I dug into it a little bit more. Uh, it, looked like a very interesting option for pain management. So that was my first patient. Um, he, so we got him onto a uh, regimen for uh, cannabis. Uh, I learned a lot from him. Uh, and uh, and as, I, as I discovered more and more, I realized that uh, this therapeutic plant has, uh, has some amazing qualities. Um, and over the years, I've ended up uh, treating everything from pelvic pain, uh, as this gentleman presented with, to various different ailments, including sleep and anxiety, etc., cetera, um, as was uh, discussed in the introduction. Um, and then, of course, that naturally evolved into me getting to some research in the area, so I'm quite involved now as well in the research uh, in the use of, of cannabis for various disorders. So hopefully what I want to do this evening is, um, I, I wasn't sure where everyone's level was with regards to prostate cancer and prostate diseases. So the first few slides I'll present you with is just sort of an overview of prostate and prostate diseases and prostate cancer. And I'm gonna go through that quite rapidly because I'd like to spend the, the majority of the time in this discussion um, related to cannabis use uh, in prostate cancer. And we'll, let, we'll go a little bit over that. It's my first time trying to do a talk off my phone, so let's see how it works out. <laughs> All right, so what is the prostate? Where is it located? I don't think anyone's, uh, you know, uh, unknowing of this, but the prostate gland is basically a, uh, a sexual gland that uh, provides support, uh, fluid support to the sperm. Um, it is uh, what uh, composes the majority of the ejaculatory fluid um, for, uh, for carrying the sperm for insemination. Uh, and, and therefore has all the nutrients, et cetera, that are required for that sperm to, uh, to make it to, through the female genital tract. Um, after that, of course, it just becomes the bane of every man's existence because it just gets to be a bit of a pain as, it, as we get older. Um, so the prostate uh, is located uh, basically, I'm gonna move a little bit, so hopefully that'll be okay. Let me know if you can't hear me. Um, the, the prostate gland itself is sort of located uh, between the urethra itself, so through, through the penis. It's, it's part of the uh, penile urethra going through into what we call the prostatic urethra, which is this component right here, and then into the bladder. So it's in between the bladder and the urethra. Um, it is underneath the pubic bone, partly, uh, and it is next to the rectum, which is very convenient that God put it there because this way it allows us to check for diseases of the prostate because we can then do a rectal examination and feel the prostate. As you might notice, that when you do a rectal examination and feel the prostate, you're actually only feeling sort of a little bit of that prostate. You're not getting access to the central part and you're not getting access to the more anterior part of the prostate. Luckily, God also put most bad diseases back here as well. So when you actually feel that prostate, 80% of the cancers tend to be located back here. There's a very small number that are up there. But that does mean we do miss some cancers on a rectal examination. 
But our examination is somewhat subjective. It's not everything. Um, we use the PSA test in conjunction with it. We use some other tests sometimes in conjunction with that as well. Because the rectal examination is somewhat subjective and sometimes it may not be a hard lump or something that you can feel. It may be relatively smooth or a lump that doesn't feel very exciting. Um, although I'm sure it's very exciting to the person getting examined. <laughs> so, uh, so, so, that's, so we use that in combination with other tests that we do as well. So there are various diseases uh, of the prostate. I've just labeled a few of them, which are kind of the more salient and more important ones that we have, uh, including uh, benign prostatic hypertrophy, uh, prostatitis, and uh, prostate cancer. So, um, there are very, as I said, there are various different diagnostics we do. There's various uh, ways of figuring out different disease processes. Sometimes we have to eliminate uh, one cause or another. So, for example, if I see a patient who is voiding lots, they're going to the bathroom a lot, uh, it may very well be an enlarged prostate and they're, not, and they're being irritated by that. But it may be, they may be a smoker, for example, and there may be something in the bladder that I'm worried about. So, there are various tests, and some of you uh, may have experienced having a cystoscopy done. This is just an example because I often have patients asking what exactly is going to be happening during that process. And uh, so, so basically, it's. Uh, I didn't change much. Okay. So, basically, this allows us to go through the uh, urethra, which I described to you, through the, pro to the, through the penile urethra, into the prostatic urethra, and then into the bladder. It allows us to survey the entire, entire system. And this is kind of what it looks like uh, if you were to attach a, a camera to this. Um, over here, we have the introduction into the prostate, that little hump that we have here. Um, it's basically the, the vir montanum, <coughs> it's sort of the entrance into the prostate, prostatic urethra. Uh, and then as you go through, you can see these sort of big lobes off the side there, and that's your prostate coming in uh, and closing down. And that's what it can look like when it's really enlarged and it blocks. And this is the most common thing that we see in men, probably starting around the age of 50 or so, maybe a little bit earlier in some, maybe a little bit later in others. But as we get older, our prostate tends to start to obstruct, and we get these obstructive symptoms where you can't pee too well. Uh, and that's probably one of the most more common uh, reasons that we'll see uh, an elderly gentleman. And the symptoms, you know, are involve everything from slow flow to frequency of urination. So I've had a number of patients ask me, well, why do I have to go to the bathroom? Or let me put it this way. I ask the patient, you know, are you passing your waters uh, well? And they're like, oh yeah, I'm passing it great. I'm going every hour. <laughs> That's not great. <laughs> so, and, and so why does that happen? So, you know, it's, I think it's interesting to think about that because basically what's happening is that when your bladder contracts, it has only so much muscle power. As it contracts, it's pushing up against this massive lobe, what we call kissing lobes, and they're like squished into so trying to push the urine out through the through, from the bladder, and then eventually the bladder is fatigued. It says, "Okay, I've had enough, and I'm stopping here." And it may only empty out a quarter of what's in the bladder before it gives up. Well, of course, within an hour, the bladder is full again because it's only uh, emptied out a quarter. And you keep doing this. You empty out a little bit, then you fill, and you empty out and fill, right? So that's a big problem because you, that ends up going frequently. So we call that frequency. And the problem with that, of course, is that the urine sits there for a long period of time. It can get infected. It can get stones. It can get bleeding. It can get a whole bunch of other things that go with it. And that's some of the symptoms or sequelae we see of an enlarged prostate. You can't empty your bladder out. You get problems from that. So the other thing that happens is uh, men start to get up more at nighttime. So normally, if you think about it, you know, as a teenager, you rarely got up at nighttime uh, to pee anyway. Um, and then as you get older, you start to get up at nighttime. So it's one of the symptoms that we do see. In fact, it's interesting. It's one of the first symptoms to come on and one of the last symptoms to go away once you treat the prostate. So it's, so it's an inter interesting uh, set of symptoms to follow. So that's kind of like enlargement of the prostate. Um, the other thing that tends to go alongside with enlargement of the prostate and obstructive symptoms is erectile dysfunction. And thank God for Viagra because no one ever talked about erectile dysfunction before Viagra came along. And uh, Pfizer did a fantastic job of advertising what erectile dysfunction was. And to the point where rather than having the wife dragging the husband in, the husband came in and said, hey, I think I need Viagra. So um, that was good, but the important thing to keep in mind is that there is an association of uh, enlarged prostates. It's not necessarily a causal effect, but there just seems to be a correlation. So as you get older, your prostate gets bigger, 
erections gets to be difficult. After the age of 45, a good portion of men start to have some erectile dysfunction. By the time you're around age 75, probably about 80 to 85% of men will have some erectile dysfunction. So it's a very common thing. The reason I bring it up is because I think there's still a bit of a stigma. There's still some uh, shyness in, in uh, discussing this uh, topic area. But keep in mind, this is like hypertension and diabetes and other things that go along with uh, being a person. Uh, erectile dysfunction comes along with that. Okay. So feel free to discuss it with your family, with your physicians. Um, prostatitis. So prostatitis is infection of the prostate. Um, if, if you recall me explaining that you can have obstruction of the bladder, uh, the bladder is poorly empty, you get a cystitis or a urinary tract infection of the bladder can happen, but you can also get infections of the prostate itself. Prostate related infections are commonly E. coli. Um, this is not hamburger disease, it's a different E. coli. Um, and, uh, and the problem with prostate diseases or prostatitis is that it's a bugger to treat. Uh, and so I always warn my patients when they come in, I'm like, I'm going to start you on a course of antibiotics, but the chances are that by the time we actually get rid of your symptoms, your prostatitis symptoms, it may take at least four or five courses of antibiotics. It's a bit of a privileged area. The antibiotics don't get in as well. Uh, the, the prostate becomes very acidic when it's infected, and most of our antibiotics work in a more alkaline environment, so it doesn't work as well. Uh, so it is a really challenging area to treat and treat well. And that's why we often see chronic pain from prostatitis because it sets up this network of pain that lasts even after the prostate's been treated. And then of course prostate cancer. So, um, you know, I've had a number of patients again ask me, you know, over the years, what's the cause of prostate cancer? We don't really know what the cause of prostate cancer is. There's a lot of theories out there, including chronic infection, possibly smoking, most likely some hereditary components. There's a whole bunch of other thoughts around it, and I'm sure that's a combination, a little combination of, of each one of these factors and, and a bunch more as well. Um, and so, you know, I mean, what I do is I tell people <coughs> the best way to prevent any cancer is just to have that healthy lifestyle, which will go well for your heart disease and will go well for your diabetes and everything else that goes with it as well. Um, and so we've gone over the anatomy of the prostate, and as you know, you can get uh, uh, prostate cancer that can be localized uh, and kept within the prostate, and then you can treat that prostate either by radiation or surgery, for example, uh, to remove it. But, of course, uh, in due course, you can get extension of the cancer. You can get local, what we call local extension into the pelvic floor, uh, but you can also then get distant metastases, so it goes it doesn't, and, and the funny thing is that it doesn't always have to extend locally before it goes distant, but generally, you know, that is one of the concerns that you can extend locally, you can get into the lymph nodes and the pelvis, and then it can metastasize on into the bone, liver, lungs, etc. Okay, um, so um, so prostate cancer. Um, Again, these are just some quick facts. Uh, these are a lot of these are American statistics, and I apologize about that. Uh, I do have actually the Canadian statistics, which I hadn't put up on this slide deck. But um, anyway, so you know, prostate cancer is quite common. As you can see, about 165,000 new cases uh, are diagnosed in the United States. Um, of, of these, almost 30,000 uh, die of cancer, prostate cancer. Uh, one in nine men will be diagnosed uh, with prostate cancer during his lifetime. And uh, prostate cancer develops mainly in older men and African American men. Um, it's about, six, about every six cases in 10 are diagnosed in men uh, older than the age of 80, uh, 65. Sorry. Um, and uh, it tends to be more rare in the younger group, especially under 40. Um, the uh, average age of diagnosis is about 66. And uh, death from the cancer uh, is the second leading cause of death uh, in American men, uh, only to be followed, uh, only to follow uh, lung cancer. Um, and about one in 41 men will end up dying of prostate cancer. So it's an important disease. And I bring that up primarily because, you know, it depends on the literature you read, the reports you read, uh, especially when it comes to PSA testing and treating. Uh, there's a lot of controversial statements out there about how useless PSA testing is and how people, how men don't die of prostate cancer, they die with it, uh, statements like that. And those are untrue, but they're not the whole truth, right? So um, 
to use a little bit of a Trumpism. Um, <laughs> sorry, I promise not to get political. Um, so the uh, yeah, so you know, I mean, the, the thing is that um, men do die of prostate cancer, and it is our job um, as a group and as physicians and as urologists to try and tease out those men that are at risk for dying from their cancer versus those that will die with their cancer. And we have some good tools nowadays, and we're getting better tools to try and distinguish those groups. But I, but I do take, you know, uh, I, I do take offense to, to hearing reports that, you know, PSA is a useless tool and you don't need to treat cancer, because uh, I have this come into my office all the time. Right, a patient reads something in some magazine and says, you know what, you don't need to treat my cancer, and they've got at least a nine prostate cancer, and yeah, I think you need treatment, otherwise it's gonna be harmful. Um, so so that's, that's an important message to get out, that there are some cancers that yes, we can follow, but there are many that we cannot, and that we must treat, or at least manage, control, if we don't care. Right? So, I mean, obviously, like any malignancy, like any disease process, the earlier you catch it, the better off it is. So that's why we really promote uh, the tools we do have. We're getting better tools over time. I'll bring, later in my talk, I'll bring up some interesting tools that have come up. Um, and uh, so right now, the PSA is a well-established tool we have. The rectal examination is a well-established tool we have. We use combinations thereof. And um, I won't be going into any great detail about the treatment algorithms. I mean, you probably have had some talks from other, uh, some of my other colleagues who have come and talked to you about various different treatments of prostate cancer. But obviously these are some of the three big categories we talk about, which is active surveillance, surgery, and radiation treatment. And then of course radiation nowadays is broken up into brachytherapy and external beam radiation therapy. Um, and then surgery is broken up into a whole bunch of different styles of how you take out the prostate as well, laparoscopic, robotic, etc. Um, so, so this is just kind of an overview and I wasn't planning on going into any great detail, but I'm happy to answer questions afterwards. This is a busy slide just showing you how a prostatectomy takes place. I don't know if anyone's, if, I, if you're interested in me going through the slide. Yes, no? Not particularly, you're here to hear about cannabis, okay. So, <laughs> all right, so. When's the next time I'm going to see this slide? Exactly. You might as well. Yeah, go ahead. You know, Please. Okay, okay so I'll just, we'll, we'll just do it very quickly. Basically, you know, in, in trying to describe how prostate's removed, um, Think about sort of a midline incision made from your symphysis pubis. That's a bone that's sitting right down above your, um, uh, above the penis basically, uh, going up towards the belly button. Uh, so you make that incision in along there. And then we basically get into, um, we actually stay out of the belly, so we, so we don't go anywhere near the GI tract, um, generally speaking, unless you've had previous surgery. Uh, we then work our way and we take the prostate, we remove it from two points, basically. Uh, this is kind of, I guess the slide's a bit fuzzy, but, but if you remember that picture of the bladder and the urethra, basically what we're doing is we're getting in there. We tend, most people tend to start at the urethra side, we, we find the junction of where the prostate ends and the urethra begins, and we sever that connection there. We then develop and bring the prostate upward toward the bladder, uh, and we identify the junction between the bladder and the prostate, and then we come down and sever that connection as well, and then attached to the back of the prostate are the seminal vesicles, and then we, and those are attached into, sort of, they go posteriorly, so, they're, they're attached more posteriorly, and we take those and we sever those connections, and then we have unblock the prostate with the seminal vesicles that we remove. Now you have a bladder up here and a urethra down here, and you simply you just got to put it back together. So you bring those two together, you put a catheter in there to allow that junction to heal. And that's basically a kind of a quick overview of how we take out the prostate. Okay. Then we do lymph node dissections and stuff as well. Those are all part of the operation often. Yes? Uh, maybe I'm not familiar with the anatomy, but it, I mean, it sort of looks like, isn't it possible to do the surgery from the bottom? Yes, like it is. Instead of going in. It is. So the that's the perineal prostatectomy. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it is. And it's a, it's a difficult operation. Um, and uh, it used to be more popular. Um, to be honest, it's, it's rarely being taught nowadays. Um, so, I mean, I know in my training I did just a small handful. Uh, it, just the anatomy is difficult um, to, to access, the, 
the space is tight. So yes, you can, absolutely. It's like there's less stuff in the way. <laughs> yes and no. Um, it, 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 the space is a bit more crowded. The anatomy is a bit more challenging. It can, it definitely, there are some centers that still do it, uh, but it's less, less common to do a perineal prostatectomy nowadays. So, so are there any regular side effects you get, like incontinence? In that not way? at all. I'm just kidding. <laughs> well, I'm Absolutely. Thinking, you take me tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, no. <laughs> there's, 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 uh, there's, of course, the side effects. Absolutely. Like any time we fool around with the human body, there's going to be potential for side effects, right? So the side effects are so the long-term side effects of doing this operation, and also partly of getting radiation treatment. Uh, are things such as incontinence, so leakage of urine. Why does that happen? Because you know when you when we take out the prostate, it's not not that the um, that your that your surgeon that did the operation necessarily is not a good surgeon, but it's because we're actually fooling around with nature. There are three basic sphincters that hold the urine in the bladder. Okay, so uh, let's see, let's see if I can get a good picture here. Um, Okay, so here's the prostate, here's the bladder, and there are three sphincters that hold, that hold, um, hold things in place. There is a soft little sphincter right between the bladder and prostate. It's a tiny little one. The prostate itself is a big kind of sphincter. It kind of blocks the leakage of urine. So when you squeeze the bladder, there's that sphincter, there's the prostate. And then there's the major sphincter. It's a muscular sphincter that sits just on this side, and it's outlined right here, just on this side of the prostate before the outlet. Okay, when we take out the prostate, we take out the prostate and we take out that little soft sphincter in there as well. It kind of comes with the prostate. If we don't, we might leave prostate tissue behind and that is risky if you've got cancer there. So we take those two sphincters out. So two out of the three sphincters are gone. And so we create more of a female type of sphincter system. So that in women, um, they have mainly that main external sphincter. Yes, they have that soft one on the inside too, but it's not a very strong sphincter. And so just like women who get older get leakage issues, men who have had prostate removed, when they laugh or cough or sneeze, they'll leak. Sometimes though, if the sphincter itself has gotten damaged or you've had radiation that's weakened the sphincter, or other factors have come into place, such as diabetes, etc. So right? Just stop for a minute. Yes. So when you go in for those 36 days of radiation, right? The odds are that it's going to weaken that sphincter. It it can. Yes. I mean, not everyone gets a weakage, a leakage. Uh, Only two percent, like myself, get it. Well, <laughs> and again, I don't know the exact statistics um, on the radiation side. Um, it's probably a little bit more than 2%. Um, there are multiple factors that come into play with it, right? Um, and you and I can talk about some of those factors afterwards as well. I'm happy to go over that. I'm just a bit I, and, and, and I believe that, I believe I saw in your, in your brochure that Nathan's going to be here next week talking about prostate. So ask Nathan. He's a great resource. <laughs> <laughs> I'm happy to answer your question afterwards, honestly. I got one last question. Yes. Quick, and I should probably wait. Can you go in and repair that? Yes, so you can repair that sphincter, but you can augment it. You can supplement the protection. So we have slings. Um, these are, these are uh, mesh type slings that can be used to, to help with that. We can use things like Botox to kind of weaken the bladder function so it's not forceful against the sphincter. There are some things that you can do to help uh, biofeedback and, and, and nerve stimulation. We do that down island. Uh, in my office, my nurse does uh, some pelvic rehabilitation with nerve stimulation with a special type of probe and, and, and it may, it may be available here in Victoria, I'm not sure. Uh, but, but yeah, there are things that can be done. Okay. Okay. All right. I'm just going to move ahead to the, uh, to the newer stuff that we want to talk about. So, um, so there's a bunch of really cool novel therapies that will evolve and are evolving and are being experimented in, in the area of prostate cancer. We've come a long, long way uh, with the treatment of this disease process. I know that when I was in training, um, way back when, uh, it wasn't uncommon to have uh, someone come in to, uh, to the office, not my office, but when I was in training, so into my, you know, into my preceptor's office, 
that would have what we call D disease or a very advanced disease, so spreading, you know, already having spread to the bone or metastasized elsewhere, or had big lymph nodes in the pelvis. It wasn't totally uncommon to see that because we missed the early stages. And then with the promotion of PSA and the promotion of prostate cancer amongst men uh, and getting checked out and all that, we made a huge divot on this disease in addition to all the treatments we've done. So that now, I can't think the last time that I had someone refer to me for prostate cancer that already had metastatic disease. It's, you know, it's, it's a very rare event nowadays relative to what it was back then. So we've come a long ways. And we are continuing to make advancements with new drugs and new treatments, such as the radium uh, 233 that's come out, you know, over the last few years, and uh, enzalutamide and abiaterone or drugs that have come out in the last few years that have kind of made things. There's a new drug called apalutamide that's come out as well. So there's a bunch of really neat things that are evolving, and as part of those, part of that is this whole idea of how we are treating any disease process, not just cancer. It's very we're moving towards what we call personalized medicine. So it's not like your cancer is the same as your cancer is the same as your cancer is the same as yours. It's more like you have a particular prostate cancer, let's say, and you have a particular genetic makeup, and you have a particular set of disease processes and requirements for your type of cancer, which is going to be very different from another person's cancer. So this is personalized medicine. We're getting more and more sophisticated at that. So this is where we are able to take information in, large pieces of information about your genetics, do genetic testings, we can get histories, et cetera, and we can, we can um, in fact, we can go as far as even putting them into computers and having uh, machine language or artificial intelligence process that information and kick out answers at the end of it about how the patient's gonna behave if we put them on enzalutamide, or is it better to put them on abiaterone? Is it better to take them to surgery, or is it better to give them radiation? And if that's the case, should we give them brachytherapy? And all these questions will eventually be answered uh, by personalized medicine. And that's kind of the way we're going towards. And it's a really exciting field um, in, in, in all medicine, but, but especially in, in, in uh, cancers. So as part of this excitement, comes along something that happened to have walked into my office eight years ago, right? So that's cannabis. So just let me shift gears a bit now, and I'm going to start talking a little bit about plant medicine and cannabis, right? Um, so, you know, the use of plants in medicine is absolutely not novel. This is not anything brand new, right? I mean, if you look at it, we've had things such as aspirin out for eons that were that were uh, that was um, that was discovered from the willow bark, all right? And so we discovered, so you know, people discovered plant medicine, they discovered a component in the plant that worked for something, so aspirin as an anti-inflammatory, as a pain medication, and then people said, well, how does it work in the human body? And so we went investigating that, you know, and we studied that, and when we did that, we found systems in our bodies that, that we started to understand. You know, so we understood that there's a system called the prostaglandin system in our, in our body, and that's how aspirin works. It's an anti-inflammatory and pain controller. Well, you know, then comes along the opium poppy, right? And from that, we got morphine. And I'm sure there's a lot of people, you know, in the world that wish that that had not been discovered, um, as we have known from the opioid crises. But, um, but you know, from, from morphine, we discovered, we went looking to how does morphine work? How do these uh, narcotics work? And that's how we discovered the endorphin system and the decathlon systems. And so we understand those really well. Well, along comes cannabis, which has been around for thousands of years and has been used uh, for medicinal and, and other reasons for many, many years. Um, and from that, we discovered that there were some active components and we're still discovering many more active components, which I'll talk to you about in a second. But the two big ones that you hear about all the time are THC and CBD. So tetrahydrocannabinol and uh, cannabidiol are two, are two components that were discovered from the cannabis plant that can be extracted. And so we said, well, how does that work? And just like in the other systems, we discovered the endocannabinoid system. So interesting enough, when I went through med school, that was not taught. But now, in med school, we are teaching more about the endocannabinoid system because we've experimented, we've learned about it, we're understanding it better, and we're understanding its functions better. And that can only help us because what will happen now, as they did with the prostaglandins, as they did with the endorphin systems, 
we will understand this better and now we will reverse engineer things. So we'll say, if it works this way and we develop a drug or if we discover a plant component that works in the cycle here, then we will have this outcome because we will solve the problem. So this is where studying the systems of these plant-based medicines work is really important. And so the endocannabinoid system is, is uh, exactly that. Okay. So, and I mean, this goes, I mean, this list is not exhaustive at all, right? So, um, you know, you can think about various different uh, medications that have been, that have been derived from, uh, from plant-based medicines. And as I said earlier, um, cannabis has a very long-standing history of being used. Um, in fact, the medical use can be traced back over 5,000 years to ancient China and Egypt. Um, and uh, in fact, there were Chinese doctors uh, that believed that the mixture of uh, wine and cannabis had a great surgical anesthetic effect. Um, this has been, the, the plant itself has been uh, used in medicine, whole plant therapy has been used in medicine for uh, thousands of years, basically. Um, and there have been uh, some amazing publications uh, which have reviewed the use of cannabis. This is going back now in time, not even recent publications that have taken us through and described uh, how it's worked on rheumatism, rabies, cholera, tetanus, uh, cramps, deliriums, uh, delirium tremors, uh, you know, from withdrawals or uh, from alcohol withdrawal and things like that. So it has a very long standing history. So one of the big um, oppositions to cannabis, and I'll just, I'll deviate there in a second here about this, but one of the, one of the big um, uh, people who oppose cannabis say, well, there's absolutely no uh, research or there's no, there's no, we don't, we don't have any medicine to, or we don't have any science to back, back up the use of this plant. Well, that's very untrue. I mean, this is just an example of the publications. So these are in peer-reviewed journals and very, I mean, I'm not saying these are all fantastic publications, and this is true for any part of medicine. We can have really good, good publications with good, solid science, and others that are a bit flaky, but, you know, make it into the journal anyway. So we, we have everything, but this is just to give you an example of how much, how it's escalating. And the reason it's partly escalating is because we're finally sort of, you know, unclouding. We're, we're, we're taking away the, the stigma around the use of cannabis. Um, and unfortunately, what happened was, um, you know, you may or may not know, but um, the, the marijuana plant, cannabis, um, was legal many years ago. And in fact, pharmacies would compound them and, you know, you have it compound, you can go buy it at your pharmacy and uh, use it for various ailments. Um, and then what happened was uh, the U.S. government, uh, in their great wisdom, uh, decided that there was a lot of bad things going on with uh, the opioids and with heroin and all these things. And so they were going to shut down, you know, the production of all these bad drugs because it was ruining their society and maybe ruining their pocketbooks. I don't know. But I'm just, you know, so what happened was that uh, cannabis got dragged into that because it was part of that prohibition period. And it got put into it uh, as a Schedule One drug, which was meaning that it was now illegal to be in possession of that. And if you, and, and the original um, uh, medicinal cannabis was actually called cannabis. Marijuana was a coin, was a name concocted by the U.S. government uh, to give this um, drug, to give this plant this horrible view. And marijuana basically is a Mexican term for cheap cigarettes. So it's cheap tobacco is what marijuana means. And so what happened was the U.S. government needed a focus an evil source that's brought this into the American society, to the North American society, and now is, is poisoning the minds of our children and they, in order to try and get it off the streets and get a, you know, prohibition on it. And so they changed the name from cannabis to marijuana. And that's how marijuana came to have its name. Um, and so um, I'm going to go back to this and I'm going to say that I'd like to encourage all of us as we talk about this plant therapy to go back to the original term which is cannabis and cannabinoids which are the components in cannabis that are active, all right? Um, and rather than saying, uh, you know, marijuana which has a very, has a very, uh, has a colloquial, you know, overtone to it. 
So the endocannabinoid system, which we briefly talked about, uh, which is what we've discovered from cannabis, um, has several roles, right? So overall, it's, it, it regulates our eat, our sleeping, our relaxing, uh, which is both physical and mental relaxation. Uh, it helps us with our memory. Uh, so basically, we think about eat, sleep, relax, forget, and it protects us. And so therefore, it has um, an immunomodulating component. So in other words, it has a way of controlling the immune system uh, through a very sophisticated method of what we call psychoneuroimmunology, which we'll could go into another day. Uh, it has some cytoprotective natures. In other words, it protects cells from damage and, and it allows them to repair to some degree. Um, it has metabolic regulation, uh, so this is everything from regulating blood sugars to blood pressures to temperature to other components that we normally regulate. Um, and it has some neuroprotection, uh, and I'll show you some evidence for that. Neuro, um, and then cancer is what we'll talk about towards, uh, towards the end of this as well. Um, so it has a varied uh, approach, it has various systems that it controls. So how is it possible that one plant can do so much. To me, that sounds like snake oil, right? Like this is what we're selling, snake oil, right? How can it possibly do so much, right? So the, in order to understand why the endocannabinoid system, i.e. cannabis and cannabinoids, can actually have such a varied effect, and it's, and it's not just, you know, selling snake oil, it's important to know how the system works. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about the endocannabinoid system so that you have an understanding about why it works in so many different systems. Okay? Um, so the presence of, so, so we, this is all through scientific research to back all this up. So this is done, has been done for a number of years through universities and in traditional scientific uh, study patterns that have been done. Before you get into that, what yes. are the negative effects? You got I, I, will, I will go over that. I will have that in my talk as well. Um, so the endocannabinoid system basically uh, is distributed in two forms. So there are receptors, we call them CB, CB1 and CB2 receptors. And these receptors are found throughout the body. The CB1 receptors are primarily found in the brain. Okay? There's the highest concentrations. In fact, if you look at all the brain receptors in our brain, which is an incredibly complex thing for some people. I won't say anything about the United States right now. But it's an incredibly complex, because I'm not going to be polite to say. Um, so it's an incredibly complex um, system that, um, that has lots of receptors, but the most uh, common and the most prominent, the largest number of, of, uh, of receptors in the brain are actually CB1 receptors. Um, there are some CB2 receptors in the brain, but there are more CB2 receptors in, um, in our uh, immune system. So, sorry, this probably doesn't make a lot of sense to most people because they're not used to uh, looking at these kind of images, but basically, oh, wow, all by the sun. Um, Basically, there are the immune cell systems. Um, uh, sorry, the immune system organs uh, are things such as the liver and spleen, uh, a bunch of lymph nodes, a bunch of areas that we can concentrate. And what they've shown is by doing analyses, biopsies of different areas, and looking for CB1 and CB2 receptors, they've shown that the CB2 receptors is heavily distributed uh, in along immune organs, but it also is, in, is also distributed in the GI tract in the testis, uh, in uh, the ovaries, and a couple of other areas too in heavy concentrations and higher rates. One thing that I didn't mention here, going back to kind of related to your question about the negativities of this, um, is something that's really interesting about the endocannabinoid system, the CB1 receptor, which is, which is where, you know, the one that works in the head. So the, the opioid receptors, they call that the, the mu receptors, um, are, have a very high concentration of that receptor in the brain stem. The brain stem is our regulatory area for our heart and our lungs. It's what makes us breathe, and it's what can regulate our heart rate and stuff. So when you hear about an opioid overdose and death, what's happened is that individual has consumed an opioid, morphine, etc., 
And because there was such a high concentration of those receptors for that drug in the brainstem, the brainstem shuts down, the breathing gets shallow, the person dies usually of a heart attack because there's not enough oxygen going to the heart, and therefore the death, the opioid death. There are no CB1 receptors in the brainstem. You could eat a truck full you can eat a truck full <laughs> of cannabis and you will not go into respiratory depression. You will not die from eating cannabis. So studies have been done over and over in different settings and there has been no direct link of ingestion or over ingestion of cannabis and death. Now, Yes, driving, doing stupid things, absolutely. You know, cannabis related, absolutely. You know, those are risk factors of like alcohol and other things. But when it comes to the receptor, it's really interesting that there are no receptors in the brainstem. Okay. With, you mentioned opioids, but then does alcohol work the same way then? Yeah, so alcohol is more of a global depressant. And yes, it does work that way a bit too, but it's not focused on just uh, the brainstem. It, it depresses everything in the brain. <laughs> and apparently kills brain cells, I don't know. My kids tell me that. <laughs> I tell them only in kids, never in adults. <laughs> um, so, the, so, so, so let's talk a little bit about the snake oil and why does it affect so many different systems. And that is because it is a regulator. So what happens here is, this is, this is kind of a schematic diagram of a nerve cell to nerve cell interaction that can take place anywhere in the body. But this, let's say this is in the brain, okay, where the CB1 receptors tend to be predominant. And normally, when we, um, when we do anything, move our limbs, smell, touch, think, anything we do, our, which our brain is controlling, um, what happens is you get what we call anti-grade action. So you get um, little, little um, messages that go from the one nerve over to the other nerve and that message is sent through a little gap between the two nerves and it's sent across and these messages get across to this this nerve here and it might this this might be bringing the information in and this might be taking it to a part of the brain that does the action right so it makes the mouth move makes the hand do things right makes Trump do what he does um, and so but not political today um, so, but basically what it does is it actually allows regulation to take place uh, downstream. Okay, so that's a normal nerve function. Interesting enough, the endocannabinoid system, so that the, the uh, so there's endogenous, okay. so we talked about the CB receptors, CB1 and CB2 receptors. Those receptors are basically like the docking ports. And you need the message, you need a messenger to get into that docking port to have it activate. Okay, so there's messages, little vesicles that are released here, they hit docking ports on this side, they make this all work. So there is endogenous uh, or chemicals in our body that mimic cannabis that are already in our system. And that's what actually regulates our brain. That's what works on the CB receptors, okay? So it's not... THC and CBD, because that's from the plant, but lo and behold, there's an exact mimic of those in our brain that actually run the system normally. And then when we consume cannabis, they act like these components, so they do the things that these components do. And so what they're doing actually is they're working in an anti-grade fashion. So what they do is they're like a feedback loop. What happens is normal message gets through to the receptor here, and then this receptor then says, okay, that's enough information. Uh, I don't need any more, don't overwhelm me. So we need to shut down the messages coming through. So what it does, it sends out the endocannabinoid messengers to go back to that cell up top and shut it down and say, okay, no more of these vesicles to come across. But this communication might be specialized for different things. It might happen for your hand, it might happen for your eyes, it might happen for your smell, for your mouth. These are all different. But the endocannabinoid system is the same. It doesn't matter whether it's the hand, the eye, the immune system, or what. That feedback loop is exactly the same in all the nerves. It's because it's just regulating. So the way I think about it is 
we've got a room full of lights here. I could walk around and turn each bulb off to turn off the lights, or I could go hit the light switch. Well, the endocannabinoid system is kind of like that light switch. If I hit it, it turns all of these things off because it regulates a bunch of systems. So it can it'll regulate your nose, your smell, your sight, your whatever, okay? So that's, that's why it can be involved in so many different systems. I'm sorry, I'm not keeping track. Um, what time are we scheduled to have to be quiet? A few, few fif 15 minutes. 15 minutes, okay, thank you. Um, I should have kept track. Um, so, so that's why we can regulate so many different systems. That's why we can regulate the immune system. We can regulate pain receptors. We can regulate uh, gastrointestinal disease uh, issues. We can regulate muscle issues. Because what we're doing is we're actually regulating the messages in these systems. We're not actually changing anything about the regulation of that. Okay? And so that's how the endocannabinoid system is kind of unique. And that's why it has so many different properties uh, in, in acting in different areas. Okay? So let's talk a little bit about dependency. There have been quite a number, because of course this is one of the big things we fear, right? If you're gonna, if you're gonna take cannabis, you're gonna become a dope. You're gonna, you know, you're not gonna be able to function because you're addicted to it. Well, interesting enough, and this is just one study, but there are multiple studies, many studies like this in different formats and in different populations um, that show that, that actually cannabis is actually a very low in terms of its dependency risk relative to the narcotics, uh, sorry, to smoking, narcotics, alcohol, narcotics. You can see how in terms of, and this is just one study, this seems to be borne out in multiple different studies. Okay, and I'm happy to send you the papers if anyone is in doubt of them because they're all out there published in, in peer-reviewed journals that tell us the dependency is low. The other argument is that cannabis is a gateway drug. It, it, you take cannabis, well, you're going to start to take um, other bad drugs. You're going to start doing heroin or coke or something else like that. And studies have been done in that as well. And what they show is that, um, that the cannabis is not the gateway component. And they've done this in very, some very sophisticated manners that I won't go into right now, but I'm happy to share. Um, you know, one on one. But basically, what, what it does is it they've shown that there is an addictive personality. So there, are those people that have an addictive personality, whether it's alcohol or nicotine or cannabis, they are the ones who are more likely to succumb to other drugs because they have that addictive personality. And so that's a that's an internal personality trait that that is harder for for that individual or, or easier for that individual to then fall into moving on. So. So if you looked at actually a number of studies they've shown that cannabis has never been able to successfully, never been shown to be that one gateway drug. Um, in fact, one of the studies showed that consuming alcohol and smoking together were a much higher risk of getting into harder drugs than cannabis itself. So we'll set a, there's some interesting studies out there and it's just about educating ourselves about this. You know, because of the interest of time, I'm gonna I'm, I'm gonna skip what I want to discuss here. But this is just a quick, to, quick thing that I wanted to talk about, which is plant medicine. So, in cannabis, in 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 our bud, in our flower, we have THC and CBD, which we've talked about, which act on those CB1 and CB2 receptors. But there's also a bunch of other things. So here's an interesting fact. Okay, um, the the actual and I'll tell you a little bit about CB1, and, uh, sorry, I'll tell you a little bit about THC and CBD in a second, but the actual uh, smell from a cannabis, you know, that cannabis smell that we get, um, that smell has nothing to do with the, with the medications that are used. So it has nothing to do with THC, has nothing to do with CBD, which are the active ingredients that we use in medicine, right? They actually have to do with the flavonoids, and they have something to do with the terpenes. And the terpenes, the flavonoids are the ones that give it some of the flavor, okay? and the terpenes in the plant are the ones that are the ones that give the lemony smell, or the pine smell, or the um, uh, lavender scent smell. Well, guess what? You've already smelled all of that in lavender and pine needles 
etc. So when you smell, for example, lavender, that smell of lavender, that's a terpene coming off the plant that you're smelling. And, you're, and so in a cannabis plant, it's the same thing. It's a terpene that gives off the smell of cannabis. And so and it has nothing to do with the medicinal part of the cannabis that we're using. Having said that, there's some building evidence that these terpenes um, and these smell profiles actually have something to do with the medicine, the medicinal component of the whole plant. And if you think about it, when you go and you take a chamomile bath or something like that, right? What does it make you do? It makes you relax and chills you out. Well, why is that? Because that smell has that effect in your body. Those chemicals are getting into your body and changing the profile of your chemistry. That's what makes you relaxed. So it's no different with cannabis. It has a smell that may be a medicinal component as well, which we still don't know enough about. We're discovering more about. So that's all I want to say about the, the terpenes in here. Um, tiny little slide, just to tell you that there are Health Canada approved indications because we're just going to talk a little bit about the use of cannabis and, and, uh, and now we'll get into the cancer part. Um, but basically, um, there, there are studies, these, these are sort of blocked off into, into areas that Health Canada has felt there's enough clinical evidence to support the use of cannabis in these areas. Okay? So for example, you know, the therapeutic benefit has been shown to be, to be seen in, in patients with chronic pain syndrome, uh, chemotherapy-induced nausea and vomiting, and uh, multiple sclerosis and spasticity. So those are, there's enough <coughs> evidence in those areas to promote the use of cannabinoids uh, and cannabis therapy uh, from, from based on the clinical trials, Can, uh, using cannabinoids for cancer therapy. However, there's lots of, prom uh, very, uh, lots of promising uh, studies that have been done and that are being do done to show that they're most likely there is a role for cannabis and cannabinoids as a chemotherapy agent, as a treatment for cancers. So let me give you some of those evidence because I think they're exciting. I think that this is gonna be our next bullet against cancer. And we're not talking about just prostate cancer, we're talking about breast cancer, we're talking about brain cancer, we're talking about various different cancers, okay? And in different forms, okay, not always the same. Um, Violent health. I'm not on call. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, I'm not call that. Um, so, give you a couple of examples. Um, preclinical trials. So, breast cancer. Now, this is so. This is um, when we say preclinical. This is in the lab. These are using cells under a microscope and looking at breast cancer cells under a microscope. Not a human being. Not a person that we're treating, we're treating it only in the lab. That's the only evidence we really have. There's one study I'll show you that is an evidence in people, and that's the very last study I'll, sh I'll show you, but uh, there's, this is in, in labs, okay? So here, and this is why it's, it needs to be studied, because in this, in this group of uh, investigators, what they showed was that if they used, um, this is now to show whether the THC, right, tetrahydrocannabinol, was actually, it actually helped to reduce human breast cancer cells from growing, okay, at this concentration, of this range of concentration of the THC, right? And, and with more uh, aggressive, um, the, actually they had better response if, if the breast cancer cells were estrogen receptor negative, which is anyone who's, who's familiar with breast cancer, there's different classifications of breast cancer, which are breast cancer estrogen positive and negative, and this makes a big difference in your treatment. So in, those, in, those, in that population using this dose, it actually stopped the growth. To me, I'm like, home run. We have a breast cancer treatment, don't we? But then you look and you go, wait a second, there's another study that showed that the very same drug, THC, but at a higher dose now, okay, what did it do? It actually enhanced the growth. It made it grow better. So how the heck is it that it's that in that as a cancer anti-cancer drug at low concentrations it does one thing, at a high concentration it does nothing? Well, what it tells us is that we don't quite understand the mechanism yet. We're still early in the game, and it may very well be that we need very low doses to stimulate to to block certain growth patterns. But if you get it up too high, it stimulates another receptor better than it stimulates the receptor that slows down the growth. Or there might be a bunch of other things going on. 
But I, I bring up this contradicting set of studies only to, to uh, emphasize that, that there's lots of exciting things to be determined, but we have to be very careful. We have to study it well to understand it well. And this is true for any drug that we bring to market. We study the heck out of it until we know exactly what concentration it is and how it works and what the side effects are going to be, right? So this is a great idea, a great uh, um, demonstration of that. So here it is. It was really well. You think that's fantastic. It's going to be the, the next bullet. But at the same time, there's an equal study that shows, well, okay, hold on, maybe it doesn't work so well. It's stimulating it, right? So with caution, we can, we can proceed, though, right? I've been out of school for too long, so what are the numbers? Micro milliliter? Yeah, yeah uh, micromolar. So micro it's just a concentration, yeah, of that. Um, and, and the molar is what size? Uh, so, so it's going to be a concentration within a mix. So, so when we put X number of particles into a volume, it gives us a molar concentration. So it's 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 just a it's a, it's a reporting of concentrations. That's all. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So colorectal cancer. Right? Again, um, at, at these concentrations of tetrahydrocannabinol uh, with colorectal cancer, uh, we found that the cells, there was a decreased uh, colorectal cancer cell survival with the use of uh, cannabis. Right? Um, and when we dropped the concentration lower, it had no effect. So that meant that there was a concentration effect. Again, very promising, very interesting laboratory testing that shows that Cannabis may have a role in killing cancer cells, but we got to get it right. We got to figure out the right concentration and dosing for different diseases. Okay, good example of something that's coming down the pipeline, maybe. Again, these are lab studies. Prostate cancer. This is really exciting stuff because, um, for example, Lincap, which is a prostate cancer cell type of cell that you can use under a microscope. And this is the most commonly used one for most of our chemotherapy agents, okay? So all the chemotherapy agents that, that you guys have heard about, including things like abiaterone and enzalutamide and, and uh, you know, various different drugs that are used over time, have started way back when in a lab with someone thinking about this drug and testing it, first of all, on cell lines, usually LINCAP is the one there that's being used. And what's interesting is that um, what can, what can, this, this group showed that cannabis actually induced the cell death, that's what this fancy word apoptosis means, it induced cell death in, the, in those prostate cancer cells. Um, and, and this just goes into some fancier areas where it did actually made, halted the, the uh, arrested the growth of those cells. But it was actually using, using cannabinoids. So cannabinoids were used to actually stop the growth of prostate cancer in a cell line in the lab. Okay. Um, THC is only one of the cannabinoids. There's uh, several other cannabinoids that can be used. So there are other non-THC cannabinoids that have also been shown uh, to inhibit the prostate cancer cells from growing in the lab. Some very interesting things, and they've worked out mechanisms of how this happens, and they've looked for certain markers and stuff. There's a bunch of science that goes in behind that. But again, exciting news, because it may be that in the future, we may have you know, plant-based therapy that works to kill cancer. Um, CBD, which is, the, which is another cannab uh, cannabinoid, uh, uh, another can cannabinoid um, also has been shown to significantly inhibit the cell growth and viability of prostate cancer cells. Um, and in fact, there's one group that, that mixed in a couple of different types of CBD and they showed in a couple of different lines that it actually worked uh, well to work well with established chemotherapy uh, agents. So some of you have probably heard about docetaxel, and some of you have probably heard also about biclutamide and uh, Casidex. So these drugs that we use in prostate cancer right now um, can be augmented, can be made more efficient by using cannabinoids. And the extension to that might be that, hey, we might be able to reduce these chemotherapy drug concentrations if they're working better with the cannabis, then we don't get the toxicity of these drugs. So maybe 
you know, the person that feels nausea and vomiting after chemotherapy with cisplatinum or something like that, maybe we can drop the dose of cisplatinum, they don't feel the nausea and vomiting, and we give them cannabis, which helps the nausea and vomiting, but it also helps the cisplatinum work better. So this is, this is again, in a lab, not in people, but once again, real promising data. Real promising data. Um, so, let's just, I want to go to the last bit here. So this is just more information on the same, different cell lines that have shown that. Um, and then again, as I said, combining cannabis with a chemotherapy agent might make it more efficient for that chemotherapy agent to work, which is really exciting as well. So what I want to do is the final thing, and that is, the, so we're talking about plant-based therapy as a way of maybe killing cancer cells, works well in the lab, maybe it'll work well eventually when we get from the lab to animal models to people. Okay, and that's normally how we do drug development. Drug development, this is drug development happening right before our eyes, but on plant-based therapy. Um, but also what's, so not to confuse, so we've talked about killing cancer cells with CBD. Okay. Um, now, there's an interesting article that was published not too long ago where when they were looking in prostate cancer, they were looking for different receptors. They were looking at the, they were looking at the cannabis receptors to see does the cancer cells, do human prostate cancer cells have cannabis receptors, and yes they do. Um, and then they were saying, well, can we tell if uh, these receptors are going to be, is there enough of them so we can treat them with, you know, with cannabinoids and see if it will kill the cancer cells, etc. When they did this, what they accidentally, or maybe not so accidentally found, um, is that the CB1 receptor in the, in the prostate cell actually uh, went along with the, the disease severity and the outcome to that prostate cancer. So let's stop and think. We have the CB1 receptor in these cancer cells, and these might tell us, based on how many there are of these receptors, these might tell us how severe our cancer is. So remember when I first started talking and I said, well, it's, it's a shame that people say that, you know, prostate cancer, you're gonna die of old age, not of the cancer, and we see that people are dying of cancer. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we're able to now have a new marker to tell which patient will die of their cancer and which patient will die with their cancer? It might turn out to be the CB1 receptor as one of maybe a plethora of others that we'll discover along the way. Right? So, very exciting. So we may have other markers other than PSA and other than the rectal examination and, and other than what we have out there to tell us the evolution of this cancer and which who needs treatment, who doesn't need treatment, which is the bad berry cancer, which is the one that we can forget about, right? And that goes back to the personalized medicine that we talked about. So when an individual comes in the office, we might be able to take a blood sample, do a genetic test, ah, okay, you're positive for the CB1 receptor, you know, we're gonna go look in and we're gonna treat you with this drug because we know that your cancer is a bad berry cancer from studies that have been done. Very personalized medicine. It's not happening now, but it might happen in the next 5, 10 years, 15, 20, 50 years. I mean, the way information is moving, it's moving really rapidly nowadays, and we might get there. So, conclusion, I think that plant-based therapy um, is exciting, very exciting. Um, hopefully, what I've, what I've explained to you today um, is that um, cannabis is not marijuana. It's a, not a nasty you know, dope head thing necessarily. Like, yes, there's people who will always use it for recreational use, and, um, and, that's, and that's fine. I mean, when you think about recreational use, let's think about how much alcohol we consume, right? So, I mean, that just may be, it may be a safer alternative than frying someone's liver from alcohol. I don't know, I mean, that's, that's, a, that's a value judgment that society has to make. But, um, what's interesting is that, that cannabis can be used in medicine quite successfully, uh, when it comes to various different uh, uh, arms in medicine, it, it is applicable to a wide variety of arms because of that endocannabinoid system that you all understand so well now. <laughs> and, uh, and just think about flipping light switch off. <laughs> and, um, and, and that's why it re works in so many different systems. But there's also very exciting news when it comes to cancer and cancer treatment as we get along, as we understand this drug better, as we understand this plant better, and plant-based medicine. Thank you.
have more in the way of information coming through to us about uh, the situation I have now is, uh, is sometimes I've had some sleepless nights or broken sleep. Yes. And yes. other times I've had poor bladder infections yes. and been in the hospital. Yes. So my so the use of, of, of uh, so cannabinoids and cold breaks so, and so and, uh, Absolutely. Yeah. So, um, so the question was basically, you know, the use of cannabinoids for anxiety and sleep. Um, really well established. Some good data to support it, first of all. Um, and um, so I, I didn't go into this a lot into my talk uh, to try and differentiate the difference between THC and CBD. So those are those work slightly differently. Um, basically, THC uh, is the um, is the one that makes you the one that can give you the high or the euphoria. So it is the it is the one that that can be psychoactive, you might say. And CBD is not. I mean, you can take CBD and drive, you can take CBD and work. Uh, so CBD is not, um, does not alter your mind in any, in any way. Uh, it is a strong anti-inflammatory. Uh, it is a strong pain medication. Um, interestingly enough, there is some, and so I, I, when I say it's not psychoactive, what I mean by it, it doesn't alter your mind, State, but what it can do is it can you can use CBD in doses to help with anxiety along with some THC. THC, which is a psychoactive component, the one that gives you the high, we use in medicine as well, but we use it in a very low dose. So, for example, the THC that we use for medicine is about one twentieth the amount that is in, let's say, a joint that a person might use to get high. Okay. So the amount that we use is extremely low in medicine, and it has a totally different effect on the patient, on the client, um, than does high doses. So what, C and what THC can do is it can be an anxiolytic, it can make you calmer, uh, depending again on the amount that you use, but it definitely is one that gives you really good sleep patterns. So we, use, so we have a number of patients that we treat for uh, chronic insomnia, for people who are just going through a rough time and really anxious and can't fall asleep, their mind can't shut off. We definitely use THC for that. We have a very specific protocol we put people through. It's not just that you get a prescription and off you go have fun. We counsel you through it. We walk you through it. We have a bank of counselors that we use through, through my clinic um, that basically will educate you. They'll tell you not to go to the States with your cannabis. You can fly across Canada with your cannabis, etc. Give you all the background information about what you should and shouldn't do. And then what we do is we dose titrate. So we start everyone on a very, very low dose and we bring it up slowly based on how it affects you. Because the dose that you might take will probably be different from the dose that someone else takes. And it's just like alcohol, like one, one glass of wine might knock me to the floor, and it might take you know 10 bottles to knock you to the floor. I don't know, right, you know what I'm saying? So it's gonna be different for different people, and so we always titrate up from there. But yes, there's a strong role for it. And the anxiety and the sleeplessness, those are Pretty much. They, they can be tied, and they can be separate. Some people are anxious but have no problem to sleep, and some people have sleep disorders without any anxiety, right? So they, they can be separated, and they can be treated differently. So anxiety, we tend to treat more with CBD, and especially during the daytime, because most people get anxious in certain situations, and we do treat you with dosing CBD during the daytime. You can function completely normal with it. On the other hand, if you have trouble falling asleep, so again, it depends on whether you have trouble falling asleep, staying asleep, or both, and then we titrate according to that as well. So, it's a, so there's a systematic approach that has been well established. So through the clinic that, that um, I work with, we have six physicians uh, and a whole bank of counselors um, that we do, and we do everything through Health Canada. So we don't give any prescriptions for you to go down to the Bud Barn uh, or somewhere else, you know, next door at your dispensary because Unfortunately, we just can't reliably say that that dispensary has been tested for its product or for the chemicals within it. They may be a great dispensary, we don't know if they've got pesticides and other chemicals in their extraction process. We do know that the Health Canada approved facilities, which, they're, which of there's about two dozen really good ones across Canada, that we do know they do, they have to test their product, they have to meet Canada health standards, they have to report exactly how much of CBD and THC they have in that oil, for example, or in that bud. So there's some very specific stringent standards that are met in those circumstances, and that's what we prescribe. Okay, and then 
from the prescription there are places in Victoria, Vancouver? Yeah, so it doesn't matter where you live, they get shipped right to your door. So at this point in time, medical cannabis cannot be bought from a storefront. So anyone that tells you that you're buying medical cannabis from the local storefront is wrong because there is no storefronts for medical cannabis. The Health Canada approved facilities are not allowed to have storefronts. You go online, you do the order online, you pay for it online, it's shipped to your door free of charge shipping mm -hmm. uh, in a secure box that's addressed to you and you sign for it and, you're, and you get the cannabis that way. That's the only way to get medical cannabis at this time. Okay. Who knows you. what will happen after October 17th. <laughs> is it in pill form? It, it is available in pill forms as well. So it's available as oils, pills, and also available as, as the uh, dry flour, which we can then recommend different ways of, of having. I don't recommend cooking because it's really difficult to get a proper dose with cooking. And I don't recommend, I, I do not, in fact, I fire patients. If they smoke, I don't like the smoking aspect of it. But we do have vapes, vaping, which is a, a way of getting the cannabinoid off in a, in a water vapor. And that's a better way of doing it. It's a safer way to do it. Um, I mean, I shouldn't say I fire people, but I discourage them. <laughs> So how do you find somebody that in Victoria that is capable of? So, um, so there is so there is a couple of uh, individuals I can give you the name uh, of them. Uh, I do I do consults online. So all my a lot of my consults are done all over Canada, but they're done online. We have a web system set up for that to secure network, etc. So it's it's all in place. So it depends on, on what the income of the individual is. So there's, we have a, a, a graduated, the clinic has, I should say, we have graduated, the, the clinic has a graduate system. So it goes from low income, which will be practically no charge, through to if you earn so much, then you will get charged up to a certain amount. I think it's, I think the high end, it's close to 200 bucks, but otherwise it can be for you, depending on the income state. How do you establish what dosage you need? Yeah, that's my, that's my secret sauce. I can't tell you that. Okay, what, what it is is we, 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 we start on a very low dose and we, we increase the dose to your symptom relief. So let's say it's sleep. So I'll give you a dose that you'll start with and I will communicate with you and you'll communicate with our, our staff and you'll tell them, okay, it's not working so we'll increase the dose or you'll say I can't fall asleep so we'll get your time, timing changed and we'll keep increasing and changing things until we find that you're sleeping through the night. Okay. Thank you. So, just a quick reminder: um, those of you that aren't hanging around for the um, snack break. Or